Hello and welcome to Knowledge, Reality, and Self's presentation on Fyodor Dostoevsky and Alexander Solzhenitsyn on the theme, Beauty Will Save the World. In this third part of the course where we're, you know, we move beyond epistemology and metaphysics and we're talking about the human person, we've covered quite a variety, a mosaic of um, understandings of the human person from Plato up through John Locke and from him on the idea of psychological continuity with Bernard Williams and Parfit talking about you know, the non-self or how exactly maybe even emotions fit in, you know, to an understanding of narratives and such. And then trying to round that out a little bit, I introduced Roger Scruton and also this concept, well, his concept of relationality and how that even then um, through uh, Zizelos when he speaks of community being an aspect that's foundational to the human person. Those were something lacking in some of the other post-Enlightenment thinkers. This is an understanding of how beauty is connected to the human person. And, you know, at first glance, it's not something that seems to be immediate. So I'm going to try to play that out a little bit um, and see exactly if I can make a connection for us as one more element. Now, Beauty Saving the World, this line comes from Fyodor Dostoevsky's um, novel, The Idiot. Uh, actually, a detail of the painting that you see there, this Dead Christ by Hans Holbein, you know, it's sometimes on the cover of a lot of editions that you can find in that book. But in real life, Dostoevsky speaks about how his encounter with this painting was, I think, shortly after when he got married. He was terrified a little bit. I mean, this is a, quite the emancipated portrayal of Jesus. Um, you know, you could almost um, grasp the decomposing, um, decomposing body. And in the book, The Idiot, you know, Dostoevsky portrays uh, Prince Mishkin, that's the idiot, as this you know, epileptic, right? Uh, naive and probably just, quite frankly, over-compassionate to the point where you know, everybody takes advantage of him. You know, in the book, just like the author, Prince Mishkin, he's confronted with this painting so of Holbein. And he exclaims when he looks at this painting that, you know, might cause one actually to lose his faith. You know, back in 1849, Dostoevsky was exiled to a Siberian labor camp. He was actually um, sentenced to execution, but it was stayed. And then he was spent four years in one of the gulags. And he grasped from that, and we should also grasp, that beauty isn't just simply something that's pleasurable, right? Uh, in other words, this suggests that beauty can be found even amidst suffering, even great suffering, perhaps, um, this, this beauty in, in that way can even redeem and uphold the human person. So the line, beauty will save the world, it's attributed to Prince uh, Mishkin, who is said to be in love. You know, so I, what I want to do is I want to look at what the philosophical underpinnings of beauty are, because one of the underlying currents of this course is for us to uncover things within culture, whether they're philosophically driven or driven through um, political aspirations or religious convictions and how we've inherited these things and they become the water that we swim in and if we're not quite clear on exactly how it's connected to our current thought we think ourselves original when in fact we may not be. So anyway, if we're going to look at objective aspects of beauty, uh, for Plato, you know, beauty is the real form. It's outside the cave and it exists in the perfection that way. And it can only be experienced in this temporal plane. So this is where we're at. But nonetheless, it's still quite objective. So he would refer to this beauty as the splendor of truth. It's almost like a wonderment that one finds by discovering these things that we would call, in the very real sense, true. Aristotle, he thought you know, beauty was more akin to some symmetrical ordering of things. Right, All the parts were just in the perfect um, order. So here you might think of maybe harmony would be a good way to say it. You know, three notes just sort of like work together in that particular way. Um, so it's this recognition that, recognizing that harmony and perfection, right? Even a mathematical ratio is the beauties of those and the way that they're found in nature. So nonetheless, here beauty is quite objective. Augustine, you know, he talks about a thing not being beautiful because it gives delight but rather it gives delight because it's beautiful. Now that might seem semantic, but let me repeat it. It's really not. Uh, beauty, it is beautiful because it gives delight, um, and it doesn't give delight simply because it's beautiful. So beauty exists actually in the qualities of the object, and then we discover them. 
you know, but they exist objectively apart from our particular interpretation of them. So it's not reliant on us. Now, by the time we get into uh, David Hume, in, we're in the 18th century. So here we're in the scientific analysis and the rise of empirical thought, um, enlightenment, you know, comprehension of the world. Um, Hume understood that this beauty only exists in the mind. So the mind contemplates beauty, but because the only things that we can know with certainty have to be something that can be empirically uh, measured, weighed, and such like that. Beauty is obviously not one of those things. So beauty has to, you know, might be true that, you know, you think something's beautiful, and maybe something is more refined or more superior than something else, um, but nonetheless, it remains that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You know, Immanuel Kant, he attributed this almost entirely to a matter of taste. Um, so, in other words, it's not some judgment that's formed from our cognition, right? So it's not a rational thought process. Uh, you can only imagine that if you were to take something like, as in Roger Scruton uh, made plain, if you were to take something like music or the painting of the Mona Lisa and reduce everything down, like through some you know, neurological science uh, filter where it's nothing more than an accumulation of its various pigments and the positions on the canvas, or the piece of music is nothing more than the relation between notes and harmony, then it could be reproduced, but it can never really get to what the painting is or what the music is in itself. So, therefore, it too remains subjective. And I just want to leave with uh, Raymond Burke that, you know, this understanding that, you know, beauty um, is something that wonder produces. So, it's, it's not, you could see it in a romantic era here, that this is a little bit more imaginative, as a reaction to the rational, empirical thought that preceded it. Um, but nonetheless, it leaves it in, in a, an imaginative point of view, which is something that is particular to each individual and therefore not objective and such. So what the point is to this is to point out that by, prior to the 18th century, you know, except for the sophists. So let me just say real quick, you know, the sophists were you know, the counterparts to Socrates and such, which he didn't care much for because they weren't after truth. They were trying to win arguments. So they would have seen this as relativistic. But other than that, um, from the time of the ancient Greeks until the 18th century, beauty was always thought to be something um, objective. You know, so it was not in the eye of the beholder. It was something that beheld our eyes. Now, where I'm going with all of this is because this becomes something that's important for us to understand our human self. In other words, if in the end we make some sort of argument that there's an epistemological ladder that goes from beauty, truth, to goodness, um, some malfunction or distortion of beauty is going to, therefore, just trickle down or trickle up, we should say, and distort our understanding of truth and our understanding of goodness. And therefore, it affects ethics, too. All right. So, like, why this matters for the human person, this, that the self, you know, is related to the world, or reality. Uh, I want to bring another literary figure in, C.S. Lewis. So, in C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man, he gives these two fictional names to the authors. He calls them Gaius and Titius, which just sort of means a guy and a fellow, respectively. But they are all actual authors. Their names are Alex King and Martin Ketley. Um, there are two authors of what he calls the Green Book, which is also a fictional name for the actual textbook called The Control of Language, a critical approach to reading and writing. It was a high school textbook. Now, within this high school textbook, um, Gaius and Titius are speaking about the... It, it's actually like a little part within the text where they're talking about a trip that Dorothy Woodsworth had took with her brother Williamsworth, William Woodsworth and Samuel Taylor, Taylor Coolidge. Now, you probably at least recognize those names upon hearing. So they're remarking on this account within their memoirs where, you know, Coolridge remarks on their walk how the waterfall was sublime. Now, what happens with the authors within the textbook is they start a commentary. And what they say, they literally said within the text, when the man said this is sublime, he appears to be making a remark about the waterfall. But actually... He was not making a remark about the waterfall, only a remark about his own feelings. Okay, so at this point, it could be a little odd for us. We're thinking, why would this be the point where Lewis lashes out? I mean, is, it, or is this a semantic thing that's going on? Does, do we really care whether or not the sublimity is in the waterfall and we experience it, or it's just something that we experience as we look at the waterfall? 
But Lewis says, look, if you're not keen to this, you're going to think that, you know, this is rather petty. Um, but there's something very deep at play here. In other words, is the understanding of beauty just a psychological, emotional response? And, you know, and purely in our own subjective experience as a viewer. So there's really nothing real to say about the waterfall. You know, it seems as if he's saying something, says Lewis, but in fact, it's nothing more than a projection of his own taste. And tastes differ, right? So, therefore, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. So just to test this theory a little bit, here's a photo that I think most people would find beautiful. Now, you might struggle a little bit to say what is beautiful about it. You could talk about its uniqueness, um, the symmetry that's involved, the fact that it's discovered in nature. But if I were to say it's ugly, I think the average person would press me to defend that position. You know, and... I would say for you to try just as a matter of um, a practice uh, to try to defend on what grounds would you think it's ugly um, or even to say how it only is relative to each of our tastes. Um, now in the back of our heads we might be thinking well perhaps we've been conditioned you know to um, view this because we think that every snowflake is um, unique and maybe we find that beautiful. But anyway, what about this young lady? I mean, once you get past, you know, the startling eyes and the beautiful hair, this is something that I believe all would find universally beautiful. Um, we could talk about the innocence of her. We could talk about how we envision her culture and her views of the world and how that might be beautiful. But it would, we'd be hard-pressed to show how this is just relative to us. This photo actually is a 98-year-old woman who moved in to take care of her 80-year-old son who is homebound. Now, there's the attractiveness, you know, I'm not speaking about them personally, but we wouldn't find these people to be um, as aesthetically pleasing as young individuals who would show on the covers of magazines. But just the thought that the mother has never lost her maternal care for her son, and even in his time of need at 80 years old, and she's still there to take care of them. So we're starting to get the sense that beauty is not just simply, as far as aesthetics, it's not simply some physical qualities, but there's other aspects that belong here. So if we ever catch ourselves seeing something like this, that would be inspirational, and we just repeat to ourselves how beautiful this is, you know, we would have to ask ourselves, are we just talking about what we think is beautiful, or is there something absolutely objective about that? One more. This woman on the left had her son killed by this um, man on the right, and he was sentenced and served 17 years. But as they moved in next door to each other, they became friends, and she overcame the pain of losing her son and decided that wasn't means enough to continue the resentment and hatred towards this man who himself was sorry for what he did. Um, it's extraordinary, I and mean, there's no other way to say it. We would find ourselves hard uh, hard pace to try to think that we could do what she did. But nonetheless, this is not ugly. I don't mean ugly and unas you know, unappealing visually. The, the thought of this is beautiful. But I think that beauty is something that's objective. So as you start thinking in your mind whether or not beauty is in the eye of the beholder or whether or not beauty is something objective, try to frame it in lieu of what I've just shown you. Now, where Lewis goes back to this waterfall and the sublimity of the waterfall is this, that, you know, it appears that he's just showing up the shortcomings of the romantics. Like, look, you're placing, you know, they place too much emphasis on experience and subjectivity. But he's really not doing that. You know, what he's trying to say is if you take this to its logical end, you know, the average school boy is, or person is going to realize that if these are only emotional statements and people are just giving remarks about their own feelings, then it is not going to take too much to conclude that none of these statements are important. In other words, we're not really talking about something that could ever be argued objectively. It would be arguing not about maybe which brand makes the best butter pecan ice cream, but it'd be arguing whether or not butter pecan ice cream is better than chocolate chip mint ice cream. There would be no standard there for us to to do those two things. We can't even talk about the creaminess or the butter fat content, none of that. We have nothing objective to hang our hat on. He's trying to say this is what is infiltering our education. If you reduce these things down to subjective aspects, 
then a person who has any intelligence whatsoever is going to realize that if it is all a matter of taste, then it really is not important what one thinks of the other. So uh, Wolf then comes through and he starts critiquing some of this. Um, he starts saying, you know, we have this aspect, right? And he would call it a West obsession with politics and intellectual um, dialectics. You know, is it's a means of overcoming like the degradation of the human person, right? So his point is that it's often forgotten if we're not understood in the first place that these things themselves, you know, they're shaped and they're recorded by the experiences of artists and mystics. I mean, you know, we engage culture. I mean, this is why Lewis was trying to really make his point. His point was with education is that you can't just impose a professor cannot impose his values on the students. That's not education. And too often, you know, it's many professors will opt just to impose their viewpoints. And then um, maybe allow the uh, prof I'm sorry, allow the student, you know, to come to their own truth. But if we, if the professor, and, and you can even think in parental um, terms, it's dangerous for a parent not to be authoritarian with their young, unemancipated children. Because if you allow 13, 14, 15, 16-year-olds to start making their own decisions, they could make bad decisions. But the reality is, is like just no switch flips when they turn 18. So they have to be groomed in a very authentic sense to be able to stand on their own. Well, the same thing is here within um, a classroom. Um, it's risky for a professor just to propose things and allow students to arrive to their own conclusions. But there's really no other way to do it um, except to you know impose their views on them. And that would be sort of like akin to pounding down the mouth of the students, right? So, you know, education used to be, um, says C.S. Lewis, this kind of propagation, you know, right? People transmitting, um, you know, understandings of culture to other people. But he says anymore, it's really become more propaganda. So like truth and goodness, right? This is, this beauty is part of that. And it's this first step on the epistemological ladder. Okay, so Wolf then goes on to say, too, about this essence of modernity, right? That um, we've become accustomed as human persons to construct our own orders in the world, right? So what happens is the outside world, um, the reality, just becomes a projection of the individual's like mind. So, in other words, the self projects the reality. And I don't mean like it constructs like whether or not the chair is there. I don't mean that. But the actual um, worth of it, the nature of it, the ethic of it, so what does this mean? This means fundamentally an understanding of the human person is adamant to have that nailed before you can move on, right? So what happens if we do this, right, in this essence of modernity, the human person just latches on to an eye, you know, some sort of ideology, you know, and that involves like a, a fundamental alienation from our own being if we had more time to play that out. But nonetheless, the self as we are, it becomes elevated against others because they inhabit the environment and the structure by which that we ourselves, um, say, create. So the artist and, you know, their quest for beauty, says Wolf, you know, even w within horrors, you know, it can offer some vision over the world um, and the self, you know, which is fragmented by this technology and this ideology, right? So it's like a, he would, Wolf calls it a new form of paganism. And the uh, difference is, is that it's, it's appealing um, because, there's like a recognition of a certain reverence to it, but it's a deceptive type thing. Okay, so Wolf thinks at the heart of all of this, to put it down, is that this misunderstanding, misunderstanding of nature and the imagination, um, it, this is something that has to be battled by the writers and the poets and the sculptors and all artists, right? And this could be anything written, could be anything performed, something like that. Um, perhaps it could just be said that, you know, the artist can even help society actually see the world for what it really is. But, you know, too much modern art is, is based on its shock value, you know, how it, um, it almost prods us for something. And not prodding us towards a, a, an objective end, but just to sort of like unseat us, that, if you want to say it that way. I wish that we can be live for this one so we can have more discussion. But nonetheless, there must be some share, you know, aesthetic um, share founded on human nature. Or perhaps we can say that it'll follow... That you know any understanding of the of a theory of the human person is going to follow from this. So we're looking for these you know these rare moments, right? Um, these like we call, might call them like a privileged glimpse of the human person and how it shows up um, within these manifestations of a mis misunderstanding of beauty, or um, as C.S. Lewis would point out, 
something that is uh, beautiful in itself. So let's ask the question now, how important is beauty? Um, is it something that we can live without? And, you know, so we're not here saying that we don't need food and shelter, but it's another way to state like how important is beauty is simply to say, can we live without beauty? So Fedor Dostoevsky, and it might be an odd thing for you to hear that he places it as the one thing that we need for life. So I won't read the whole quote um, from his book, The Possessed, but, you know, he talks about William Shakespeare and Raphael. Um, he talks about, you know, all the cultures of England and Germany and the Russians. Talks about science. But it's interesting, he says, even without bread, life is possible. But without beauty, um, it is impossible, for there'll be nothing left in the world. Now, that seems like quite the overstatement uh, for us. But I think he's making the overstatement as a means of emphasis, if nothing else. So, Solzhenitsyn uh, won't put up his Harvard address, but in 1978, he gave a Harvard address to the graduating class. Um, I think it was, it was 1978. And here's an excerpt. He says, We've placed way too much hope in political and social reforms, only to, be fi only to find out that we're being deprived of our most precious possession, our spiritual life. He says, In the East, it is destroyed by the dealings and imaginations of the ruling party. In the West, commercial interests tend to suffocate it. He says, this is the real crisis. If humanism were, was right in declaring that man is born to be happy, he would not be born to die. Since his body is doomed to die, his task on earth evidently must be more of a spiritual nature. It cannot be under um, unrestrained enjoyment of everyday life. It cannot be the search for the best ways to obtain material goods and then cheerfully get the most out of them. It has to be a fulfillment, something permanent, an earnest duty to do what one's life journey may become an experience of moral growth so that one may live life a better human being than one started. Um, this, the title of it is called A World Split Apart, something you should probably read. Uh, the point is, is that you know, many want to change the world, um, but they find it very difficult to change themselves. So, you know, we may, we may want to stop global climate change, you know, but we offer very little alterations to our own styles of living. We think it's going to happen outside through some system and such. You know, we want to see more equity amongst economics in the economic sphere. But very few people become champions of the poor or try to live, um, you know, lives of precarity themselves. You know, um, for the people that do have means, it seems to be much easier to give money than their own time. So nonetheless... Um, in Solzhenitsyn's article, then, uh, Beauty Will Save the World, he states that art, you know, has some protective force um, from the culture and over the culture. And he goes on to say that there really are two types of artists. He goes, there's this one here with whom art is not desecrated by our carings on, right? It doesn't lose sight of its own origins simply because of that. So the artist thinks themselves as the creator of this independent spiritual world. He says, the other type of artist thinks themselves as a small apprentice beneath God's heaven, where there is this sensation of a stable harmony. So, you know, art and artistic human existence, um, well, let's say, first of all, it's ubiquitous, right? I mean, it's been that way in our world. Uh, as a matter of fact, Solzhenitsyn goes, out, goes on to point out that archaeologists have yet to ever discover any stage of human existence where art did not exist, right? So when then does this say something about the universal aspect of the human person? If that has been how... Art has uh, always been prevalent in cultures from recorded history, then what role does art play in an understanding of who we are as human people? Sultanitz would say you have to consider that it has a significant amount there to say, which is what we're trying to make the point here. So it's something universal, right? We're discovering something uh, necessary to human nature that we can't live without this. And I realize the, you know, the credibility that I tried to show were from literary works, but again, I think the fact that we've stepped away from some of these great aspects of literature um, has not fed us well. We'll leave it at that. But anyway, if what Solzhenitsyn says is true, then Dostoevsky's line that beauty will save the world um, is nothing more than a prophecy, right? One more uh, little literary addition here. If you read Brave New World, there's a conversation. Well, I'll have to get back it up a little bit to just quickly explain this. So they all lived within this city community um, in perfect 
scientific leisure. Um, every, all their needs were uh, accounted for. Um, everybody was genetically predisposed for the work that they did. So if you were you know, an alpha or a beta, you had the higher intellectual cap capabilities. And then if you were a factory worker, like an epsilon or such, you had just enough uh, wherewithal to do the repetitive job that would otherwise drive somebody with a higher IQ insane, right? Um, but there were these uh, reservations that were outside of the city where they did not live in that scientific comfort. They were known as savages and reservations. So people within the city would sometimes take like, you know, like day trips, if you want to call it that, to go out and see how they lived. Well, when one of the helicopters on this trip crashed and they show up at this trailer where there's this young person, John, who they then convinced to come back because this would almost be like bringing a specimen back from, you know, an indigenous tribe that the world has not seen and let's bring them into the city so everybody can ask questions and see exactly what goes on. And what they realized is that the people who were savages were the ones that were steeped in literature and beauty and art. And the ones that were scientifically controlled within the cities were the ones that lived their life um, according to pleasure and efficiency. So this was a clash. And um, Mustafa Mann, like, let's just say like the controller of this group, the leader, he's questioning um, the savage about this. And the savage says to him, I don't want comfort. I want God, I want poetry, I want danger, I want freedom, I want goodness, I want sin. So Mustafa says, all right, so you want to be unhappy? He goes, yeah, that's right. I'm claiming the right to be unhappy. I want to grow old and ugly and impotent. I want syphilis and cancer. I want to have the right to have too little to eat and the right to be lousy, the right to live in constant apprehension and what may happen tomorrow, the right to catch typhoid, the right to be tortured by unspeakable pains of every kind. There was a long silence, and he said, I claim them all. Now, what he's saying here is that I want to be human and that those things which may be deemed unpleasurable still can have aspects of beauty which, quite frankly, are more important to us than um, the comforts that they have scientifically arranged. So something to think about there. Um, the bottom line for this then is, is that, and the point of all of this, is it demonstrates that we can almost like reverse engineer the human person you know, what are our needs? Because if we can get our needs, they're going to reveal the aspects of the personhoods, uh, of a personhood. So if these things are the, quite frankly, some of the things that we die for, again, beauty, truth, goodness, justice, equality, and liberty, are not empirical understandings. They're things only the humanities can really delve into. But those are very important for who we are as human persons. So that starts to give us a different nuance in this mosaic of we're trying to come up with what does it mean to be I? What is this I that I am? And how do I relate to those around me? So these needs, they uncover aspects of our personhood. So if, again, if we reverse engineer and we discover the design, then the design of the human person will sort of relate to our nature. Well, it will relate to our nature. And then we declare this nature as something objective. Right? Because we can't simply say, well, that's yours and this is mine. And we can either do that for beauty, if beauty is going to be connected to who we are as human beings. Um, this would put us at odds you know, with a lot of the philosophical and cultural thinking in the last 200 years. But, um, as I showed up at, at the top of the screen, um, we would be in continuity with almost all recorded history of the human person prior to the 18th century. Thank you for listening.